inside all of us. It's a war between the flesh and the spirit. Polar opposites, and it cannot be one on our own. One leads to a life of all-consuming, yet never satisfied once. Cheap sex, a rancid accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, impotent gods, frenzied and joyless, grabs for happiness, magic show religion, divided homes, and divided lives, paranoid loneliness, uncontrollable addiction. The other leads to a life of peace, joy, and love for others. A war is raging inside all of us. Happy July 1st. It's hard to believe the year's half over, isn't it? It's half over. Seems like yesterday we were celebrating Christmas and the new year, and here we are. Almost 2019. That's what it feels like, doesn't it? Just almost right there. So I'm so glad that you're here this morning. We are actually wrapping up a series this morning called World War U. And if you've been tracking with us in this series, we've been uh, talking through the battles that are within us and how do we, how do we win the battle against the flesh? Uh, and it's one of those things to me that's incredibly challenging in our life because the first thing, you've got to be able to recognize that this thing is actually happening in your life. Uh, and we talked through, we set that up for several weeks and we didn't resolve tension for you. And then last week we actually went into uh, something that most people are very familiar with and talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And, uh, and what that means for us in our life and how we're to, to walk this out in, in a daily basis and in relationship with, with other people. And this morning we're going to pick up where we left off and we're going to actually get into Galatians chapter 6 a little bit because there's something that you have to see from, from the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 through 25. And he picks up in verse 26 and then he goes into what I believe is Here's a practical way for you to live out what we've just talked about. We just talked about the battle against the flesh. We've talked about the fruit of the Spirit and love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. We talked about all of those things. And then he gets into chapter 6 and he's going, okay, now this is what this looks like in relationship and in context of, of living life with other people. So that's where we are today. So I want to just pick up real quick just in setting the stage once again, and hopefully by the end of this, you've got Galatians 5, 16, and 17 all worked out for yourself, and you got it memorized, because I've gone there every week because it's such an important passage of Scripture in these two verses because it helps us identify this truth that we all live in on a daily basis. So Galatians 5, 16 says this, but I say walk by the Spirit, right? That's what he's talking about. And you will not, there's the promise, you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. So that's, that's the promise that I, I, I'm telling you the Christian life hinges on this thing. Uh, not your salvation, I'm not saying that, but I'm telling you to, to live out everything that Jesus commands us, even if, take the two simplest commands in scripture, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are crazy impossible on our own. And Jesus As he left the world, he looks at his disciples and he goes, I know you're not going to be able to do this. So I'm going to send a helper. His name's the Holy Spirit. And so here's the promise. If you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And then he goes on to verse 17 and he says, For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. So these two things are in opposition. Have you ever been in conflict with someone in your life where you just can't seem to get on the same page? That's flesh and the spirit, and they're never going to get on the same page. These things are not just in opposition, they're in conflict. They are waging war against one another in their life. And then he goes on, he talks about, so they're in opposition so that you may not do the things that you please. And we talked about Romans chapter 7 in this, in this series where Paul takes Romans 7 and he says, hey, the things that I want to do, you know, those godly spiritual things, I'm not doing those things. And the things that I don't want to do, which are the flesh and envy and jealousy and strife, and maybe there's other things that are in there, and he's going, I'm, I'm living in this constant battle with these things in my life. And the things I want to do, I'm not doing. The things I don't want to do are the things that I'm doing. And he actually goes on to say, who's going to save me from this body of death? And then he goes on, I love Romans 8, where he says, there is therefore not no condemnation for those who are in Christ 
Jesus. And that's the very good news for you that you need to hear this morning is that even though you're going to live in conflict, you're going to live with these two things in opposition to one another, you need to know that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the moment that you fail doesn't mean that you should run away from God. And you and I both know people that have failed in a lot of different ways, and their, their response is that they're going to run from God instead of to God. But the invitation from the Father is that, hey, even when you completely mess up, come back to me. Come back to me. Luke 15, you, you're probably familiar with the story of the prodigal son, where in the prodigal son, the, I believe the Father is on that porch every night waiting for the son to come home. Because finally the day comes where the son comes home and the father runs out to meet him. And I just want to tell you, that's God in your life as well. That's not just God in uh, that parable of the prodigal son. That's God in your life. It doesn't matter how far you think you've drifted, how far you think you've gone. The father has an open invitation to say, come on, why is that? Because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So then he's going, hey, but I've given you this, this, I I don't want to be mystical about it, but I've given you this power source. I've given you this, this thing, this person called the Holy Spirit. I've given him to you so that you can actually live a victorious life as you walk in this world. Because if you walk by the Spirit, the promise is you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So what does that look like? And that's where we're going to go today. So if you have a copy of God's Word, I want you to um, turn to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to pick up verse 26 and then go into chapter 6 all the way to verse 10. But here's this big picture that I want you to think about. I try to give you this big picture, this big idea as we walk through this passage in terms of what it looks like. And it's just simply this, that when you walk with the Spirit, think about that, when you walk with the Spirit, you walk with people differently. That's a, big, that's a big concept when you really think about it. We talked last week about walking with the Spirit and what does that mean. And the image that I really left you with was just the image of me going for a walk with some of my young kids. And my older kids, they're not necessarily going to reach up and take my hand. In fact, they would swap my hand away if I tried to actually hold their hand and go for a walk. But my younger kids, if I were to uh, go for a walk and take them by the hand, then they will, they will reach up and they will grab my hand and they will walk with me. And that's, that's to me the image I get when I think about what it means to walk with the Spirit. To walk with the Spirit that I'm reaching up and I'm just following His leading and His guiding and His directing. And listen, it's not mysterious, by the way. It's not mysterious. If you're sitting there today and you're sitting there going, well, I'm, I'm not sure what the Spirit's leading and guiding and directing me to do. Guess what? You want to know where it's found? In the Scriptures. If you ever wonder, like, what is the Spirit telling you today? What is He walking, how is He leading you? As you reach up to grab His hand, how is He leading you? Guess where you're going to find it? In the pages of the Scriptures. Because, listen, here's the thing. That's where God spoke. That's where God spoke. Now, Holy Spirit can leave you an impression. It can convict you of sin, those types of things. But I want to tell you, like, if you want to hear from God, you're going to hear from God through the pages of Scripture as the Holy Spirit is indwelt within you. So you don't have to make it some mysterious thing. When you want to walk with the Spirit, just get into the Word of God because as you dig into the Word of God, He will show you how to walk with the Spirit. He will show you where the Spirit is guiding you in your life. It's not mystical and it's not mysterious. It's just opening the pages of the Scriptures and just going, okay, God, what is it that you have for me today? I'm a big believer in that. When you read the Scriptures You should be reading it and get to the place where at the end of your reading, you should go, okay, God, what is in this for me? What is in this for me? What is that? What are you trying to teach me today? What are you trying to show me today? How do I need to live my life differently today through the power of your Holy Spirit? God, show me these things. If you're reading the scriptures just to read the scriptures and not hear from the Lord, then you're you're, you're missing out on this huge opportunity. Because God wants to reveal himself to you and how you should walk and how you should live your life. He's not trying to make it mystical and mysterious. So when you walk with the Spirit, He'll show you. You open up the pages of Scripture, and especially if you open up the pages of Scripture and you see how Jesus interacted with people in the Gospels, and then you begin to open up the Scriptures and you read in the New Testament about um, how Paul is encouraging us or Peter is encouraging us or James is encouraging us to live in community with other people, you'll find that there's very specific things that he actually has for you. 
And this morning, we're going to look at a couple of those together. So, uh, Galatians 5, 26. This is, this is huge. This, this, to me, this, this verse, this one verse, can change how you live in relationship with other people. Because I'll bet that in some ways you're like me, and you, you look at this verse, and it says, let us not become boastful. Listen, it's not, no, nobody likes a prideful person. So let's not be boastful. But here he goes on, challenging one another and envying one another. Now this is going to speak specifically to living in community with each other. We're going to talk about that as we get into it. Let's let's get into the rest of what he says. Now he goes into chapter 6. So that's the first thing. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Then he goes on, brethren, um, even if if anyone is caught in any trespass. Now that word trespass is the same word for sin. If any of you is caught in sin, now you might know of people who are caught in sin. He says, you who are spiritual, you you who are walking in the Spirit, you who are um, walking in communion with the Lord, and you're you're not into, the I I would say, a a habitual pattern of sin in your life. And he says, you who are spiritual. Now listen, you can't walk around, by the way, you can't walk around and say, hey, I'm spiritual. That's... What is that? That's the boastful person. I mean, the spiritual person is also an incredibly humble person. It says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit. Here's a key word, right? This is, this is the, in line with the fruit of the spirit. In a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to your own self so that you too will not be tempted. Now, that's, that's so that you and your life are, are taking inventory of your own life, so that you're not going, hey, I'm looking at your life, and I see that you're walking in this sin in your life, and and you need to be careful, but you in your own life, even as you approach that person, you're, you're looking at your own life going, is there something in me that I need to pay attention to, so that someone doesn't have to come to me and say, hey, hey, I see that you're caught and entangled in this sin in your life, so you've got to take inventory, and listen, here's the thing, and I go back to this, It's the humble person that is able to take that approach. The person that would call themselves spiritual and and boast about their own spiritual walk, and they do this and do that, and they would never do that. Well, that's the person that's going to get entangled in sin, and it's also the person that's going to look at someone else, and they're not going to seek to restore someone with gentleness. See, when you seek to restore someone with gentleness, you, you are looking at this person, you're going, man, my heart aches and it breaks for you because I know that God has so much more for you in your life. And I don't want you to get stuck in this one thing. It goes on. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to one another. For each one will bear his own load. The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those in the household who are of the household of faith. Now that's, to me, Paul just going, this is how you live in community with other people. Think about it. If you walk by the Spirit, you will walk with people differently, and Paul is laying out a different way for you to walk with other people. And here's, there, there's two things, and under each one I've got two points, I just, and they're real, they're real simple, but, but they're so practical in how you live your life. And the first one is this. You've got to understand that comparison kills community. Comparison kills community. And here's what I mean. If you pick up in verse 26 of chapter 5 and what he talks about, he says, you know, those who are challenging one another, those who are envying one another. And those two things happen when we are comparing ourselves to someone else. And let's just, let's be real honest. Just real honest. Everybody in this room, on some level, is comparing themselves to someone else. You're looking at someone else, and you're, you're looking at them and with envy in terms of going, man, I wish 
I had their life. I wish I had their resources. I wish I had their job. I wish I had their, I wish, I wish, I wish. And you, you, that will kill the community that God desires for you to have with those who are in the household of faith. But then there's this other side of it, and there's those who are, are, are challenging one another, and then those who are thinking that they're, they're better than everybody else, and they're comparing themselves going, man, I am so glad that I'm not like this person. It's the Pharisee and the tax collector when Jesus is talking about praying, and the tax collector goes in, and he beats himself in the chest and goes, oh, Father, have mercy on me. And the, the, the Pharisee walks in, and he says, God, I thank you so much that I'm not like that tax collector. And see, in our minds, we're thinking that is so true, but we neglect to look at how that plays out in my life. And we're comparing ourselves to someone else. We're comparing our families. And it's, it's been fascinating as, as my wife and I, um, as we have five children, and, and if people look at us like, you have five children? How in the world do you do it? And it's like, really, it's the same way that somebody who has one does. You just got to get through it. I mean, I don't know if you've experienced that in your life, but, but I'm not trying to say that my life is better than anybody else. My life's different because I have five kids. But I in no way want to say, like, my life is harder than your life as a parent because, look, this is my deal. You know, God, for some reason, saw fit. We wanted four kids. God gave us twins last. We got five. It's like bonus day for us. I mean, it wasn't that big. But, of course, when we're going through it, and my wife and I look back, and we're sitting here going, man, I can't believe it's been eight years. Eight years ago, you know, I'm sitting in one chair. I've got one kid. She's sitting in another chair. Got the other kid. The other three kids are running the house doing whatever. But we're just getting through this season. And, and listen, I know what that's like. And, but listen, I know what that's like with one kid as well. And the thing that we f- we're in danger of in, in living our lives is to think that we're better or worse off than someone else. And the truth of it is, we're not. We all go through different things. I Believe me, I get that. But just because I'm going through what I'm going through doesn't mean that my, my load or my burden is more or less than someone else's. And the truth is, I mean, God knows, God sees and I just want to be one of those people that, I just want to, I want to be that source of encouragement for you. I don't want to say that my life is better or worse than anybody. I don't want people to feel sorry for us. My wife and I love the fact we have five kids. We love it. So there's two things in this that are fascinating. The first one is this, and they're just real simple commands. One is stop comparing. <laughs> stop looking at someone else's life and thinking that they're better or worse than you. You just got to look at your life. Listen, this is what God has given you. This is what God has entrusted you for whatever reason. I don't know, but this is it. This is the hand that you've been dealt. And it, you might feel like it's a raw deal, but here's the thing that I'll tell you. There are people around the world who have it way worse than you do. Way worse. Way worse. I met with Amy the other day. We were talking about her trip to South Africa, and she's telling about some of those kids. And 86% of those kids have been sexually assaulted. Think about that. You know? You got to look at your life, and you got to stop comparing, going, I'm better or worse, and just go, this is what God has given me. This is what... Is, is here today. And I know some of the things that some of you have gone through are incredibly painful, and I'm not trying to discount that at all. Please don't hear me say that. That's not what I'm trying to say. But what I am saying is God has given you His Holy Spirit. God has given you His Holy Spirit to walk with you through whatever it is that you are facing and going through. And can I just let you know that that's enough? That's enough. The fact that he's gone, hey, I, I'm going to come in through my spirit and I'm just going to take up residence in your life. And that's enough for you to walk in victory. That's enough for you to experience the peace that passes all understanding. My Holy Spirit taking up residence in your life is everything you need. So stop comparing yourself. 
to someone else. Stop envying and stop being boastful. Two opposite sides of the spectrum. The person who's envying others is not boastful. They're looking and wanting and desiring someone else. And do you know how many people in the world would love to be sitting where you sit today on a Sunday morning gathering to hear God's word in freedom? So stop comparing. And then the the second part of this is start helping. And this is where you look at this passage and you go, okay, so what is what is he talking about? Because there's two things that he says. So Journey doesn't know that I'm about to ask him to come up here, but Journey, I want you to come up here for just a minute. Because I want you to understand what he says in these two co- concepts. He's really the strongest person that we have on staff, which is why he's here, and the youngest with the best back. Um, and so that's why one of the reasons he's here. You might be up here for a few minutes, okay? So, uh, but I want you to listen to what he says. He says, bear one another's burdens and therefore fulfill the law of Christ. So bear one another's burdens. So what does he mean? Because here at the the end of verse 5, when he gets to verse 5, he says, for each one will bear his own load. So there's two different things that that Paul is is talking about in this passage. So Journey, this is not yours that's really heavy. This was one that was just in the back. So I just want you to put that on for a minute and just, this this is Journey's, this is Journey's load. And Journey's load is that Journey is a a husband um, right there. He's, He's a father. And this is the load. And guess what? You can't be a husband and you can't be the father that he's called to be. You can't do that. That's the load that he alone is carrying. Now you can come alongside and you can help him. And there are other burdens that he is facing in his life. As he and Lindsay are walking in this world, they have other things that they are dealing with and, and, and raising this young girl that God has entrusted to them. And I don't, they may have given up. They may have said, you know, we're, we're good with one. We're good with one. Watch out, because if you say two, you might get three. There's bonuses. They're involved in this whole thing. You never know what's going to happen. But he, he is a husband and a father that you cannot be for him. That is the load. He, and not only that, but then there's his own walk with Christ. So you can't, you, can't, you can't adopt someone else's faith, can you? You can't ride on your parents' coattails into heaven. So it, some, in, in some way, your, your own walk with Christ, you've got to take that on yourself. You've got to take responsibility. You know, it's one of those things where we hear from people is, in church leadership, we hear from people that say, well, I'm not being fed, I'm not doing... This. And listen, if you're, if you're someone who is spiritual, that's the word here, you should be able to feed yourself I'm just throwing that out. That's free for coming today. But you really should be. If we're able to say, hey, I'm spiritual, guess what? There comes a point where you can feed yourself. My 14-year-old who doesn't want to go for a walk with me also doesn't want me to cut up her food for her. She's feeding her. You should be able to feed yourself. That's free. So this is his burden. Now, there, there's, uh, this is the load that he's carrying. Now, there's other burdens that he has in his life. So I, I did the best I could with what I had resource-wise, but this is a pretty good paint bucket. I want you to just hold that for a while. <laughs> because see, the, the truth of it is there, there are other burdens that, that he's going to encounter in his life. And as a young father and a, as a new husband still, they're trying to figure some things out. And, and there are ways that, that people can come alongside of him and help with the burden that he has. And as he's in ministry, I know that's one of those things we talk about with, with people in ministry. And listen, God has been incredibly faithful to us and in my family in ministry, and I know that he's going to be to journey as well because that's who God is. But there are responsibilities that we have in the household of faith that we should be coming alongside and we should help carry this burden a little bit. You know, one of the things here, I'm going to let you carry that for a minute. Um, one of the things that you, you think about in ministry, and this is something that's so true, is people in churches would come alongside and they would say, you know what, you know, God's called you to ministry and you, know, you should just be able to step out in faith. One person stepping out in faith. One person. But what would happen if 400 people stepped out in faith and said, we want to help carry this burden? You see, we want, to, we want to say, no, Journey should just step out in faith. And, you know, God will provide, God will provide, God will provide. And that's actually what he's getting at. If you look at verse 6, he says, The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. 
That, that's, actually, that's actually those who are, are walking alongside of you and teaching you the, the God's Word. And they're saying that those who are taught should come alongside and share the load with those who are doing the teaching. That's just one perspective. Now, if you were to remove ministry from this whole picture and you were to have anybody else that's standing up here, then there's other things and other ways like, hey, Journey, you're a new husband. Can I just walk alongside of you and, and just help you a little bit with, with uh, what that means and what that's been for me in my life and how I've succeeded and failed in a lot of different ways? Can I just do that? Or, hey, I'm not trying to tell you how to parent because, believe me, as one who has five, I don't like people giving me their parenting advice necessarily and saying, this is how you should do it, but rather to say, this is what I've learned. This is what I've learned in this, and you can take from it whatever you want, because listen, that, this is a philosophy methodology thing. There are certain things in Scripture, absolutely, but then there's other things that are just about uh, personal preference. I parent differently than, than other people, but you know what? I can still come alongside and say, hey, you know what? Let me help carry this, carry this burden with you for a while. And now here's the thing. I would challenge you to say that if in your life you are not coming alongside of someone to help carry their burden, then you are not fulfilling the law of Christ. Okay, one person agreed with me. Thank you. I don't know who that was. Thank you. Appreciate that. You know what I'm saying? And now here's the thing. If you were, Jesse, come up here for a second. Because this is getting hard for me to hold this. I ain't going to lie to you. Just grab a hold of that handle somewhere. There you go, yeah. Oh. Man, if we had someone that could come and just... You see, you see the picture? This is what the household of faith should look like for us. The, the household of faith is that we should, we should come alongside. I just dropped that. You see that? And then one person drops out, and the other one's got to pick up the slack. But there's so much in this picture. Think of the burdens, and if you're living in community with other people, in your small groups, and you're having these conversations, how, how, do, we, how do we help you? Oh, you, you, listen, my own, my own small group several years ago, uh, we moved in our, in our house, we moved, and I was flat on my back, waiting for back surgery. And my small group came alongside, and they helped get things done at my house. And then there were other people from the church that came in. And, and I was actually joking with Travis the other day. He was talking about how tired he was from moving. And I said, yeah, I don't remember that because it's been so long since I've done it by myself that I don't remember that, what that was like because people came alongside, and they helped carry that load with me. And this is what we have to get to in the household of faith. All right, you guys can put that down. Are you tired yet? I'm tired from... All right, Journey, next service, you'll hold it longer. I'll buy yourself. <laughs> you should get into some regular conversations with people, and you should ask this question. What can I do to help? What can I do to help? What can I do to come alongside and help you with whatever it is that you're facing and going through? Oh, you and your wife are just having some problems. You know what, can I, can I just watch your kids for, for a little bit so that you can go out together? Sure. <laughs> Come on. Come on. We have five. The thing we've learned is a few more into the fire just means they're distracted. <laughs> Come on over. You know, you guys are getting ready to move. Can, can we help you pack? I'm not really good at moving anymore. I do have this back issue, so I don't try not to carry a lot of heavy things. But there are ways that people that you're living in community with to say, what can I do to help? You should learn to ask that question of people that you're walking through life with. And especially in your families, men, that should be a regular question that you ask your wives. Instead of trying to be the one to fix it, because most of us are, they want to tell us something, and you're like, well, you should do this, 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 and this. And she's going, I didn't ask you for that. But you can just simply say, you know what, what can I do to help? What can I do to come alongside of you and help you through this? Start helping. Okay, now, next part. Uh, comparison kills community, but generosity, generosity builds community. Generosity builds 
community. And he goes into this thing, reaping and sowing, which is, most of us, we hear that in context of, of giving financially, and there is that principle that you find in scriptures from, from what Paul teaches us in 2 Corinthians. He says, if you sow sparingly, you also reap sparingly, but if you sow abundantly, you will reap a harvest of abundance. That's just the principle that you find. There is a principle of sowing and reaping that is found in the scriptures. And when, so when you think about it, generosity, I, I, I stumbled upon this really great definition of generosity from dictionary.com because that's one of my go-to places for definitions. And it says this, generosity is readiness or liberality in giving. Now, that, that's that financial aspect, and, and, and some of us just have to have a bigger picture and bigger picture for ourselves and what God is calling us to in community in order for us to do that. But then here's this other thing that generosity means, which, which doesn't even seem to have anything to do with finances. So if you're sitting here going, well, there's the pastor talking about money again. Well, just listen to this, what he says. It's, it's also generosity is the freedom from meanness meanness like being mean to people like thinking about my kids stop being mean to your brother or sister that's the conversation we have ongoing in our life freedom from meanness or it also says or smallness of mind or character so think think of it just beyond this idea of of giving although that's part of it but it's also you get into this place where you are free from meanness so generosity builds community because people are free from being mean. Wouldn't that be cool? If, if that were removed from the people that we walk in community with, that, that they're just not mean to each other. There are people that are just downright mean to each other, aren't there? But what would happen if it says that you would stop sowing according to the flesh? Well, in so into the flesh, there's a lot of, when you think about the fruits of the Spirit in there, or the fruit of the Spirit, there, there's a lot of, okay, that's not so into the flesh anymore. That's now so into the Spirit. And when you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption, because why? Because at the end of the day, it's going to die. And there is that financial principle in there, when you go to Matthew chapter 6, where he says what? He says, set your... Uh, where your heart is there your treasure will be also so set your heart on things above keep seeking first the kingdom of God kingdom of God kingdom of God in your life and then all of these things will be added to you and and we think that's a really great verse and a really cool song that you sang 30 years ago in your life but but then how are you living that out because Paul is bringing it right back around to us again in Galatians chapter 6 and he says listen if you sow according to the flesh then you're going to reap corruption and if according to the flesh is all it is is about building your own little personal kingdom of self, whether that's you keep all your money for yourself or you keep all your time to yourself or you keep all the gifts and talents that God's given you and you just keep them to yourself to build your own little personal kingdom, you're going to miss out on a whole lot of what God has for you. And if, in case you need to go back and read the scriptures, you would also find that all of those things that you're building into your little kingdom of self will all pass away. I had this little joke that I tell people. It's not really a joke. It's actually true when you read the scriptures. But you know that everything in this world one day is going to burn up, right? There's going to be this big fire. And then God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. So stop living for the kingdom of self. Stop living for the kingdom of self. And then two things. Think about it. Number one, be generous. Be generous. Whatever that looks like for you, be generous financially. Be generous with your time. Be generous with your gifts. Be generous to come alongside with people and help carry their burden. And let's not be a people that are saying, you know, I just really don't have time for that. Because at the end of the day, you don't have time not to. Be generous. And this means that you're going to look outside of yourself and you're going to stop sowing according to the flesh and you're going to start sowing according to the Spirit, believing that, listen, here's the thing, when you sow according to the Spirit, and that's what Paul's talking about in Galatians, when you do that, 
somehow, some way in God's economy, I don't understand it, you don't understand it, but somehow, some way, God takes that when you sow according to the Spirit and He multiplies the harvest. He multiplies, I don't know how. That's God's economy, that's God's way, but I'm telling you, there's a principle in there that if you sow that way, you will reap a harvest of abundance because that's the principle that you find in Scripture. So what are the seeds that you are sowing in this life? Think about that. What are the seeds that you're sowing? Are you a generous person? You know, if you were to plant one seed and one seed, or just start planting seeds everywhere. Like, I'm going to plant seeds. I'm going to be generous. I'm going to be generous. I'm not going to look at it and go, oh, this again. No, no, no. I want to I wanna learn to be generous. And then here's the second thing. This is simple. Just, just do good. Do good. I mean, he, he actually reiterates that twice. Verse 9, he says, let us not lose heart in doing good. Have anybody, has anybody lost heart in doing good? I know I have at times. Feel like you've been taken advantage of from time to time? Me too. But Paul's sitting here, you're going, no, no. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart, because when you sow according to the Spirit, you reap according to the Spirit. So don't lose heart. Don't grow weary. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel and say, you know what, I'm done. Nope. Keep sowing. Then he says this, and I love verse 10. So then, while we have opportunity, listen, I bet if we went around and just polled everybody in the room, I bet we all have opportunity. I bet we all have opportunity. Now, some opportunity looks different for some than others, and that's why you can't compare yourself. You just got to say, listen, while you have opportunity, while God has people in your life, while those things are crossing your path today, and, and you have this chance, God's positioned you today for something. So while you have opportunity, he says this, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. And when you think about that word, um, I, I, I want to just say, I, I believe this word means do good. I believe it's real simple. That we don't have to overthink this and go, well, I don't understand the, the, the Greek root word of what it means to do good. It just means to do good. It means be a nice person. It means to walk in the Spirit. It means to sow according to the Spirit. It means that God is positioning you to be the light in the midst of the darkness. So do good to, first he says, to all people, but especially those in the church especially those who are in the household of faith, man, we should be a people that are singing the praises of one another. Because God uses one another to help carry the burden that we all have in our life. So we should do good to all people, but especially, especially in the church. But you know, somehow, some way, the the church has this reputation out in the community. And I'm not just talking about one specific church. I'm just talking about churches in general. And the reputation of churches out in the community is not that we help one another. It's rather that we tear one another down. But yet, the scriptures are telling us, do good to all people, especially to those in this household of faith. So what would happen if the people that you sit around today you just walked up to him at the end of our service and says, you know what? Tell me a little bit about what's going on in your life. And what, what could I do to help? I mean, I have, I, I'm not talking about financial resources, but I'll bet there's something that I can do to come alongside and help you. To be that source of encouragement for you. To help you carry the burden that you have. So that you know. So that we all know that we're not in this alone. In fact, the opposite is true. We're all in this together. We're all in this together. And when we will walk by the Spirit, we will walk with people differently. And the world's going to stand back 
And they're going to look and they're going to go, huh, I guess there really is something to this Jesus after all. And if you haven't read the book of Acts, that's actually what happened as the church exploded. And it says that the church, as they were meeting one another's needs, began to have favor with all people. Because when you walk with the Spirit, you walk with people differently. Let's stand together. I'm going to pray. And we're going to close. Father, thank you so much for, thank you so much for people in my life who have come alongside through the years to help. Thank you for friends. Thank you for family. Got to thank you for my wife. Thank you that you're with me. I thank you that there are others who have walked with me. And God, I pray that we as a church would experience that same kindness from those who sit in these chairs so that they're reminded that they're not alone. And they're reminded that there's a God who cares so deeply that not only did he give us his spirit, but he sent us his people to come alongside and help. And Lord, we thank you. We celebrate your faithfulness to us. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray.